Hey ladies and gentlemen, what's up? This is your host Ken Ivy, aka Pippin Ken. Once again, you watch a view from the game. I got the ultimate player with me, man, the ultimate educator, man. This man is, if there was a word called dualistic, this is him. You know what I mean? Mr. Dualistic himself. Hey man, this is a good friend of mine. We've been knowing each other for years. It's not the first time. Y'all might have seen him in other interview I did. Now we coming in uh hey look here, man. Y'all make sure you <coughs> like, share, and hit the uh and make a comments and hit the subscribe and you can also send a super <coughs> chat if you want to you can send a super chat to me or you can send a uh, cash app to 404-790-9627 if you want to cash app cash app to reek you know for his uh contract <coughs> you can give me a cash app yeah um, to king dollar sign king flex 818 yeah so cash app you know and just put view from the game and we didn't know how to put it on our taxes. <laughs> What's up, so brother? So, man, how you been, brother? I've been, I've been, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back again. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. So, man, you know, a lot of people see Hidden Colors. A lot of people read your book, uh, Mackin and everything. So, the question, I want to, how do that, where do it start for you, Joe? Give us a, a little bit about where you came from, your upbringing, and, you know, where you was born and so on and so forth. Well, um, I was born in Detroit, and, um, at a, as a small child, they moved me down to Birmingham, Alabama, so mm -hmm. I lived there for about 10 years, and then I came out here as a teenager to L.A. and been out here ever since, and just got in the game out here, man, been stomping the, the streets out here in L.A., heavy, um, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I was really wanting to be a, a music producer. That was my thing. And, you know, just got into all types of other stuff. But I read a lot when I was out here because, um, you know, I went through the little homeless thing and I had to stay in a library. And um, a lot of the hustlers looked out for me out here. And I just picked up a lot of game, a lot of stuff I learned from the hustlers, a lot of stuff I've picked up in the books in the library. Um, as a young dude, we would go out, me and my buddies, and holler at the ladies at the club. And we had little techniques and styles that we used. And then I said, let me put this stuff in a book. And I wrote a book called The Art of Mackin'. And that book was written in 1999, came out in 2000, became a huge best-selling book. Um, they put me on all types of major television shows. The book sold like a quarter of a million copies. And that just took off from there. Then all of the other publishers wanted to come to me to get some more books out of me. Because at the time, when I did The Art of Mackin', a lot of the books were like Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, these real simpish books. Mm -hmm. My book was like, hey, this is how you be a player with yours. So nobody was bold enough to come out with a book instructing people on how to have some real game from a so, man's so perspective. So did you grow up with your mother and your father? I grew up with my, my father was in Detroit. I didn't grow up with him, but I grew up with my mother. Okay. And my mother, and sometimes I would stay with my so grandmother. You, you always do these very intellectual uh, uh, speaking engagements. You're a great lecturer. You're a very good orator, orator mm -hmm. you know, oratorical skills. So uh, did you go to college? Or did you, you know, how did you learn all this wisdom? Was yeah. You, uh, was you a good kid at school? And so I was a pretty decent kid in school, and I was... Um, articulate because my mother worked for the phone company. She was an operator, so mm -hmm. she was very articulate. So she made sure I never mispronounced words. That was okay. real important. So I learned that early on. Every time I would try to talk in some kind of um, country slang, she learned, don't do that. You don't, you know, the word ain't this, it's that. So she would correct my English. So I learned early on how to articulate myself and, and um, speak with, with you know, perfect diction. So, what kind of grades you got? I, I got pretty much. I got pretty good grades, but I was school bored me because you know I'm, I know this stuff, and you know I'm, I'm trying to do something else. I'm not trying to be stuck in Birmingham, so I actually dropped out of school. And when I, I came out to LA, I was I wanted to go to college. I didn't have no money, too young, so I got into a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, ironically, I do lectures at colleges now. I've done lectures mm -hmm. at Yale, like and Mount. yeah, yeah, I do all these lectures so at you, colleges. Did you hustle when you were young, you sell drugs. Or? No, man, I did a whole bunch of stuff. You know, right. I did a whole bunch of stuff. But um, one thing I don't ever talk about any particular things in the streets because, um, you know, they sometimes when you do stuff in the streets, when you hustle. When you talk about what you've done, the people who were around you, mm -hmm. sometimes that's like a dry snitch by proxy, okay. you know, because I don't want nobody sitting with a pen yes. trying to put two and two together. So, yeah, in 1995, you was with such and such. We got such and such for that. And you just said you did this. So that proves what he was doing. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so yeah. you. Yeah. I, so why the statue, man. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, they don't give a fuck about no damn statues, man. With um, um, Bill Cosby, they'll create a new statue, dude. I would, with Bill Cosby, they they made a new law where you can charge somebody for something uh, a gazillion years ago, um, yeah. you know, and, and they'll make up a law. 
And that's how they got Puffy with, with the whole Puffy thing. They got him based on the Bill Cosby laws mm -hmm. um, saying that um, if you allegedly, if somebody accused you for doing something 20 years ago, you have until this date to now we've extended the date so that you can file a charge on the person. So as black people, that shit really hits us. Right. So there's no so, such thing as a statute of limitation for us when it comes to black folks. We got to understand that. Now, white boy, you know, there's pictures of white people lynching folks and they're still alive today. They, they participated in murder. There's, they, they let them go. The woman who was involved with the murder of um, Emmett Till, mm -hmm. they knew about that woman. There was a warrant for the woman. They just never acted on it. They mm -hmm. were like, oh, that was so long ago. Mm -hmm. So they don't do the so long ago thing with us. You know, they, there's no statutes okay, with so us. Okay, so you come out here and you're homeless. So yeah. how, how, how did that happen, you know? Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm homeless. I'm dropped out of school. I don't um, have any skills to get a job. Um, I can't get an apartment because I'm too young, um, don't have no credit. So it's like the only good thing about that was that I, when, you, when you're young, because I was a very young person, mm -hmm. you can absorb a lot of the hardships that go on. So even though I was homeless and I would stay at the library, um, some of my partners stay at their crib, some of the women, the little girls and chicks I would meet when I was young, stay with them. You can absorb that when you're younger. Older, if you're homeless and you're older, you have bills and you have responsibility, you know, that can kind of throw you off. You know, that'll take somebody over the edge. At the time, I didn't really have any responsibility, so that was something that I could absorb. So you did, you did a county jail time while you was here, too? Huh? Oh, yeah, I did. I used to go to jail all the time, man, because I used to hang with my, my gangster buddies. Some of them were bangers. Mm -hmm. And... They would do gang sweeps out here all the time. Mm -hmm. They would do these gang sweeps. So if we were out and about at a mall and they had the Nike Cortez shoes on, the cops roll up, okay, that's gang paraphernalia. All of you guys going to jail. I'm like, I'm not a banger. Well, nigga, you with them. So, yeah, you, you're you a defector. You might, yeah, I might well, yeah. yeah. I'm by defect. So, yeah, if you're with them, you in it. So, yeah, yeah, I got caught up a few times. A lot of people don't know this about you. you know, they they yeah. just see the hidden colors and they just say, oh, this brother, you know, mm -hmm. he's a scholar, PhD. Yeah, you know, you, I seen you go with the best, Dr. Anderson. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Francis Crest Wilson. You know, you, my idols, absolutely. Yeah, you toe to toe with these legends and these scholars. So, and you know what, man, the to be a hustler, to be on the streets, especially out here at that time, mm -hmm. you kind of had to be a smart person. Oh, okay. A lot of the hustlers were smart. You right. was a hustler. You, you, you and I've had conversations, man. <laughs> it's like talking to a road scholar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you know, talking to some real hustlers, somebody who can survive out here, mm -hmm. you can't be done. You can't mm -hmm. be no dumbass nigga running around here talking that bullshit because right. you'll get caught out there or somebody will off your ass. Or a simp. Yeah, you, you get caught out there and somebody's going to look at you as simpish. So, real hustlers, man, are some real smart people because a lot of them, they understand the laws. A lot of them kind of know how to work their own cases. Mm -hmm. So, you got to kind of have a, a, a smart disposition about yourself in order to survive for real. So, so you know, uh, I pretty much ran to you. You know, they, me and you had similar books, and we mm -hmm. end up on a lot of podcasts together. Mm -hmm. You know, you wrote the book, The Art of Mackin. Mm -hmm. I got the book, The Art of Human Chess. So I just wanted to know how, how was you into the Mackin, or you, how did you get the, the you know, you, you have to be a scholar, or you have to be somewhat abreast with that particular subject to write on this. Just being, man, look, I just being around in the streets, man, just knowing all the hustlers and being around. Um, I was no drug dealer, I was no, but I know drug dealers. Rick Ross, that's my buddy. So I, I knew what he was getting down with. I knew what other cats in the game were getting down with. Um, a lot of the hustlers, I knew what they were getting down with. I knew Fillmore Slim up there. Fillmore would come down here. Um, the Rosebuds and um, the Hollywoods and all of these um, real thorough L.A. street dudes. Um, I would see what they do. Lee Mack was a very good friend of mine. Yeah, Rest man, in peace to Lee Mack. I mean, yeah. Lee Mack would chop up game and lace me with game all the time. So these were people that I would run into and just kind of run with and soak up game from. And that's inspired you to write the book. That inspired me to write so the book. Give me, a, these give, give me a couple of tactics out the book. You know. Oh, man. you. <laughs> I mean, not me, them. I, no, but, you know, the book was written for the Square Cats, though. That's what the book was written for. Give us the book, yeah, Give us the book was basically how to use some of the knowledge that the street dudes would have mm -hmm. and kind of tweak it so that the square dudes could use it at the club and just kind of have their mouthpiece crisp. Mm -hmm. That's what it was all about. So, like, what man, what was some of the stuff? Because um, when you go to the club, kind of have your wingman with you 
Um, if you're talking to a girl, if she has a friend, have your buddy there to talk to the girl so she don't run an appearance. Just little stuff like that. We okay. have little tactics in there. So you need for, to go get the book otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so much. I, it's, it's a whole go thing in the book, man. You got to go get the book, Art of Mac. And I wrote it 20, no, not even 20 years ago. Not this 30. was like 20, yeah, almost yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah so yeah, like 25, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so we get out of out, out Mac and so one day I'm, on, I'm looking at the television and I see Hidden Colors. Yeah. And I go on YouTube, I see Hidden Colors. And I'm like, this is not the man that I know. I'm like, man, how the hell is this man speaking so eloquent and so articulate? Now, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm kind of, when I was in prison, you know, I, I studied the 13th Amendment and it talks about slavery is a box itself with one duly commits a crime. And I hear you uh, elaborate on that a lot. Can you talk about how that law came up in the prison system, the criminal justice system, as you was telling me about the call centers and stuff like that. Yeah, so slavery in the 13th and 14th Amendment, they said, well, there can't be no more slavery unless you are accused of a crime, unless you're convicted of a crime. So what they did, instead of saying, we're gonna put these people in slavery based on race, we're gonna do it based on them being criminals. We're gonna criminalize every single thing they do. Mm -hmm. That's when the Jim Crow laws came into play. So if we rode a bus, if we sat on the wrong side of a, the, a chair, if we drank from a certain water fountain, all of that is gonna be criminalized. They literally went out of their way to criminalize us, so that would justify putting us in the prison system and forcing us to work for free in the prison system. We gotta understand the prison system is a plantation. A lot of folks don't know in federal prison, you have to work, they force you to work in prison. So um, this whole bullshit about just making license plates, it ain't about license plates. People in there making furniture. They're using the prisons as call centers. They're using all types of products that's made in so prison. a lot of time when you get a call from people, it's from There's somebody prison. in jail. Yeah, yeah. So it's a person sitting up in jail that you're talking to, a customer service person. Um, a lot of the products are shipped overseas. So they, they're making a profit off of the um, products that are in prison. That is the new slave plantation right now. I was hearing him give a speak. He was talking about the black codes. Mm -hmm. and he was talking about a lot of the uh, the criminality, a lot of the laws that was enacted after 1866 uh, uh, during the Reconstruction in order to delegitimize and, and demonize the black men were laws that are still in existence, like the black codes. If you look at a black a white woman a certain way, and I, you know, I want you to expound on that. Yeah. So we got to understand. Laws and common law. See, the dominant society, they operate now of common law. So that's where they get us. So even if the law ain't written on the books no more, they still practice it by common law. And they, they have these common laws. So when they deal with us, they all are on code and they know how to deal with us um, through osmosis to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, they understand if a black man is accused of doing something to a white woman, no matter what it is, you're supposed to punish that black man. The Jonathan Major situation is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. the, the the Hollywood actor was with his white ex-girlfriend. She attacked him. He's running from her, but she said she got whooped on. So her word over his, he got convicted. That's the same black code. Mm -hmm. Even though it's not on the books no more, it's a common law. The people in the dominant white society understand. So it, it, it connects back to that 13th it, it, Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But now it's just the common law. They know. Slavery. Right, right. Um, when we get shot by a cop, when we are jaywalking, you're not. the Constitution says you're not supposed to do that. You, um, it has to be equal protection of the law. Um, the, the punishment must match the crime. We're not supposed to get killed over traffic stops. But the common law says, okay, this white cop, whatever he says, he was justified in doing it. You see, that's right. a common law. Well, you know, I'm very resourceful and I do a lot of research because, you know, we're both authors, so we have to research a yes, lot. Yes, indeed. And uh, in my research, I was coming across the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex. So, without speaking specifically to no specific war overseas that's currently being perpetrated, we do know that I argue the point, and I want to see what your perspective is, I argue the point oftentimes that when you see those bombs indiscriminately being just bombarded on a specific area, those bombs is not necessarily trying to hit its target, it's just so they can get rid of those bombs and they can take the American tax dollars and, you know, through the military industrial complex, which all of them are complicit because they go through venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. And these venture capitalists invest in military stock, and these stocks, 
You know, if people think it's just wars, just having it, but in reality, you know, it's for them to re to sell, give it that old stock and, and replenish the military industrial complex. Yeah, that that's true. That part of that is true, and also when they do um, hit these bombs in these certain countries, that's to destabilize some of those economies as well, so that they can hoard the resources over there. So that's why so much stuff is going on in the Middle East because of the oil and mm -hmm. the resources. So anytime they find out there's a resource in any of these countries, then they'll send the military presence in there to, and then they'll create some kind of um, justification. They say, "Well, oh, they threatened like the weapon of mass destruction." Right? They said yeah. such and such had weapons of mass destruction, so we had to go in there and take all the gold. Um, that country over there threatened us, so we had to go over there and take all of their oil. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, um, just a, a bullying tactic that they do all around the world. So uh, in in the same breath. The uh, prison industrial complex. I remember the last time I talked to you, you talked to me about Bob Barker, the condiments and stuff like that. Him owning all the condiments, and you spoke on some things about how the C C C CCA, Correctional Corporation of CCA, Correctional Corporation of America, how this is all on the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. How does that prison industrial complex? It, it, it connects to the African American. Uh, experience here in America. Well, we got to understand how these people play monopoly with our lives. The same people who own the, and, and this has been talked about many times, the same people who own the prison industrial complexes. These are some of the same people who are running think tanks with these judges, mm -hmm. and they encourage these judges to throw more black folks in jail because these judges are with these think tanks. Also, these people who own these prisons who, or who have investments in these prisons, they have investments and they own some of these record labels. So they put the artists out and tell them, drugs, 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 get high, get high, get high, shoot, shoot, shoot. And then when people go out here, shoot, shoot, drug, drug, get high, get high, they go to jail and the record labels make money and then the prison industrial complex makes money. It's like the whole Bobby Smurder thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know the the ins and outs of Epic Records money, but the, the minute um, Bobby Smurda got that major record deal with Epic, when he was up there jumping on the table and all of that, he get hit with like, some Rico charges and go to jail for seven years. So now his catalog is absorbed by Epic Records. He has a hot song. That. Right, right. So that catalog gets absorbed. So we got to understand how that game works. That thing did a billion on YouTube. That's Man. a lot of money. Yeah, yes indeed. So the minute he gets signed, he was independent. Mm -hmm. That was an independent record. It was hot. Epic gets with it. He goes to jail and Epic gets all of that. And whatever debt, it, he's, it's all owned to Epic. There's another thing that was real interesting out here too, man. Um, some black folks were trying to buy the Crenshaw Mall. Mm -hmm. They got underbid. It was a company that came in mm -hmm. and offered less money and got the bid. One of the guys, a part of this investment company, is a guy who's, um, I think he's one of these Russian oligarchs who's tapped into Warner Brothers Records. This is the same guy who owns Nipsey Hussle's catalog. Mm. You understand? Mm -hmm. And we saw what happened to Nipsey a few blocks away from the Crenshaw Mall. Mm -hmm. Nipsey was buying that, well he didn't, wasn't, he, he actually bought that whole complex over there where they were trying to throw him out where his store was. Mm -hmm. For years, they had gang injunctions on our brother. They were trying to throw him out. All of a sudden, he gets his record deal with Warner Atlantic. They got his catalog. He gets shot. I don't know what happened to that property, but now these Russian oligarchs out here who own the record labels and own the real estate in that same area when we look at the paperwork, it looks like a lot of money is coming to them. So we got to understand the monopoly game out here, man. It's real. So that segue me to my next question. Perfect segue. So yeah. uh, I was sitting down with this gentleman. He's a very distinguished gentleman. You know, he's uh, so part, of, so called part of the conscious community. And we was here in L.A. We had a discussion about reparations, mm -hmm. and he said that it's his belief that. Uh, all of the uh, publishing and all of the rights that were stolen from my brothers and sisters, you know, during, uh, you know, back in the day, Chuck Berry and those eras of time, Marvin Gaye should be a part of reparation because it's so much money connected to publishing. Mm -hmm. You know, you think mm -hmm. of Michael Jackson owned the Beatles publishing. Yeah. When he, when he died, he sold for a billion dollars. Yes, it did. And, you know, me and you, we've been in the record industry. You know, I get published. I've been on 40 million records, mm -hmm. Little John, Too Short. 50 Cent Nelly, mm -hmm. so I received publishing through ASCAP and BMI. So when you think about that, you know, in reparations, 
and and uh, this brother argument that you know we should, can just take the publishing and we good because hip hop is the second largest export of American export and then hip hop is also considered the new Black Wall Street as Brother Yuckmouth said who's out here in your hallway right now mm -hmm. he says the new Black Wall Street because Black Wall Street GDP was 2.5 billion mm -hmm. but Jay Z is worth 2.5 billion so one man today African American man is worth the same GDP of that era. What do you say about the music and the publishing and just period? Right. Um, now, the publishing thing, that's interesting with Michael Jackson. And another thing, what they didn't like about Michael Jackson, Michael owned everybody's publishing. When he got that Sony catalog, a lot of artists were under that catalog. Mm -hmm. And what Michael did, a lot of folks don't realize, those artists that you named in the 60s who mm -hmm. were getting jerked, Michael was giving them their publishing back. Oh, Little Richie, oh. he was giving them their shit back. Oh. They really didn't like that part. That. Yeah, a lot of folks don't know that. He was giving folks their publishing back. So that's why they were like, oh, no, nigga. No, 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 no. We're not going to let you get away yeah, with that. Raise their consciousness. Yes, indeed. Um, but the thing is, going back to reparations, no, the reparations is going to have to come from the United States government, not publishing, because it was the United States government that had black people stuck in slavery. We couldn't get out of it because of the entire government, not just the record labels didn't exist at the time. Right. See, that would be a difficult sell. But the United States government was there, and they had these laws and codes and that, yeah, the entreaties that forced us into slavery where we could not escape it and we had to make money for this country that was uncompensated. That's who we're going to go after for the money, the United States government. I was reading this book called The Black Tax. You, you familiar with that? No, I haven't heard about that. What's that about? Well, this brother, he did an assessment and he was saying that if you do the minimum wages, mm -hmm. say if the minimum wage was 50 cents an hour, at that time you had 5 million slaves, 8 hours a day, you know, that's $4 a day, that's $20 million a day times 250 years, you know, which is a whole lot of money. He said, if you just went and you equally paid up, not pain and suffering, not punitive damages, none of those things, just on the minimum wages alone, which minimum wages went up, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a 250 year span. He said that the government will owe us trillions of dollars. And then he said, if you add, you know, the school system where uh, they purposely had the school teachers doing that every time, you know, uh, 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 stop at eighth grade. Mm. So most of the teachers in the uh, African American community, they couldn't go beyond eighth grade, and they were the ones who were teaching the children. But if they hadn't been allowed to educate themselves because of intelligence, they would have been able to financially and intellectually, you know, uh, uh, think they self out of poverty. So he said that was another tax that you know the United States government. He said that that's just. From that perspective. Oh, yeah. And that's a little piece of it. It goes deeper than that, man. They owe us so much money for the miseducation because they made it illegal for us to read. Mm -hmm. um, for the breeding because we were getting bread. That goes beyond just labor. Mm -hmm. Nobody was bred before. Where they would breed people and take their children and sell your damn children. Yeah, your that's children are 100% tax. Right, 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 right. That your children are priceless. We weren't just picking cotton. We were creating some of the infrastructure in this country. Patents Washington, right. We, we have 50,000 patents. That's when we got out mm -hmm. of slavery because when we were in slavery, we couldn't get a patent. Mm -hmm. Most of the inventions were coming from us. Doorknobs, the modern refrigerator, the modern toilet, dry cleaning, potato chips, the new improved macaroni and cheese. We, we've created so many things as foundational black Americans. Um, electric lighting. Um, Lewis Latimer wrote the first book, Black Man Foundation. Charles Michael, Drew. Yeah, Charles Drew. We Percy were creating. Yeah, we're, we were creating all of this stuff, man. So we're owed big money, all across the board. Okay, so it's gonna be it's, it's gonna be real dear to you because you actually wrote a uh, you did a documentary on it. Mm -hmm. Gabriel Prosser, did Mark Vincy, mm -hmm. Nat Turner, John Horse. Yeah, all of these brothers tried to. We vote against the United States government. Mm -hmm. Why was Haiti successful? Um, Haiti was successful, and let's be clear, the Black Seminoles were successful too. A lot of folks don't yeah, know that. Yeah. Haiti was successful because they understood that the white supremacists were the problem, and every single one of them has to go. Not this whole, some are cool, some, no, no, no. There's anybody who's a slave owner, 
anybody who has a white supremacist mindset, they're going to have to go. So Haiti was successful because, number one, they tapped back into uh, the voodoo system, the voodoo religion. Mm -hmm. So they said, OK, we're not going to use Christianity to drive us with this thing. Mm -hmm. Let's tap into an African spiritual system. So they got their spirit together. They got their military game together. Um, they got their intellectual game together. They got their strategy game together. And that's how they got all of those different forces. Who was forces. the mastermind behind that? The, they had a code. The code was the mastermind. That's the thing. So I'm talking about Tucson. No, Tucson, that was one. But the real guy was Dessaline. Dessaline. Dessaline, right. yeah. Dessaline was the general who beat Napoleon and all those other guys. Right. Um, so, again, uh, it was another guy before Tucson. It was Bookman. All of them were on code. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. All of them did what they needed to do. Bookman, even though he got caught and he got executed. So the call and response system. Right. But just to, just to be codified, knowing that all of us, the the ultimate goal is freedom mm -hmm. no matter what so if they get me y'all keep fighting mm -hmm. so that's the thing the code was the the leadership so when they got rid of um bookman toussaint took the reign when they got rid of Toussaint got killed too mm -hmm. then um they him, right? they yeah they tricked him they tricked France, him right? they, they took him over there and uh, locked him up locked him up and starved him so yeah, but Dessaline wasn't playing that shit. Yeah, He's Dessaline like, yeah, you're not taking cold. me nowhere. I'm getting rid of all of you guys. They He beat them so bad. <laughs> um, there was a brother who worked with Dessaline called Jean Zombie, who was one of his soldiers, and he used to slice the shit out them white supremacists so badly that the word zombie comes from him. When you right. see The Walking Dead and all that zombie stuff, that's why the early zombie movies were always Haitian voodoo monsters. Right. So when you see The Living Dead and all these zombie so movies... way of cold and letting them know yeah. who... What's right, so yeah, that whole zombie thing. White society were so afraid of the word zombie. They to this day, it's uh, they turned it into a monster thing. So why do you think that uh, they might basically and Gabriel Price and Nat Turner, yeah. you know, of course Harry Tubman, she did a good job. Right. But I'm saying, why do you think they were, weren't successful? You think because of snitching? Yeah, with um, Denmark Vesey, it was some snitches who got him. Denmark Vesey had like nine thousand people in South Carolina ready to turn up. But some somebody let some snitches know, and the snitches got them. Um, Gabriel Prosser, snitches got him. John Horse was actually successful in yeah, Florida with the, Seminoles, with right. the Black Seminoles because the United States government actually made a treaty with them. Mm -hmm. um, the treaty was for them to leave Florida and um, go to Oklahoma. And that's what they did. And uh, yeah, your, your mentor, uh, uh, Dr. Clark Anderson, he said yeah. that's how you got the name Jacksonville, right? Yeah, that's from Andrew Jackson. Yeah. And um, even Dade County. Dade County was a white general that the black Seminoles slaughtered. They, they killed that dude and killed all of his men and then chopped him up. General Dade. So who was the Indian dude that was, uh, was it? Uh, there was a few. Um, no, no, no. It was um, um, Osceola. Osceola. Yeah, they got Osceola, Florida named after him. And um, he, so he was, was one that was working with John, right? Yeah, he was one. Yeah, they had the, the Red Seminoles and the Black Seminoles, and they were all working together. The Black Seminoles were the military arms of um, the Seminole fighters. They said that John Horse is the only black man that killed tons of white people and they never got prosecuted or we, died we, for. Yeah, 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 and lived to his old age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the only yeah. brother to do that, man. And he bragged about killing white folks all around the country. Yeah, yeah. In, in retaliation. In retaliation, right. right. Yeah, let's, let's be clear. Right. He wasn't no vigilante. Yeah, he wasn't, he, no, he this, wasn't no just killing white folks. There was right, a war going on. Right, he, he was killing killed. the white supremacists who were trying to get at him. Yeah. So, yeah, people don't talk about John Horse. That was a bad boy. Yeah, that's my, one of my favorites. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, Brother uh, Tariq, we always like to have, you know, our guests to speak to the children. Mm -hmm. But if you got any kids, speak to your kids and say something positive. You know, to leave a positive impact on me. Listen, kids out there, man, all you kids out there, um, read. I know that's kind of cliche, but reading is good. You got to get off the iPads. I got kids out here, and we always, I, I was at home today with my kids, making them read. Reading is good. That's going to really step your game up. You got to understand, when you're on your iPad, when you guys are on YouTube, kids, notice a lot of you guys see real goofy stuff pop up. And it's fun and entertaining, but it's designed to pop up to kind of deaden your brain so that you're not going to be intellectual. So you want to limit some of that goofy stuff that you're watching on YouTube, people doing all of these little silly stunts. That's by design. Um, get some books, man. We got a book right here, man, for children called Hidden Heroes from A to Z at HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. This is a real good book, man. What makes you fly is you being a kid with a tight mouthpiece and some good intellect. 
that's going to be real fly. So you really want to step your game up at, at a young age so that you can get your paper up like Uncle Tariq and Uncle Ken over here. Yes, so um, get your intellectual game up and get your read on. So you've been watching View from the Gang, and you want to leave your uh, any information? Your yeah, man, look, if you guys are in a, um, we got a, a whole museum out here in Los Angeles, man, the Hidden History Museum in L.A. Again, for more information about that, go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com. Um, go to um, fbastream.com. That's where you can see all of my documentary films. And just educate yourself. Real good stuff. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching the View from the Gang, like I said, subscribe, like, and comment. Hey man, I'm your host, Ken Ivy, aka Pippa Ken. I got my esteemed guest, uh, the man who I learned from, the man that, you know, we rocked together for many years. Mm -hmm. And once again, if you like what you hear, please hit that super chat. Uh, or you can also leave a cash app, 404 790 And Tyreek going to give his cash app if you want to make a donation. Uh, King Chris Flex, Ronda. yep. Dollar sign King Flex 818. Okay, so that's how we keep this popping, man. Y'all like this wisdom, this knowledge. You know, Y'all pay the universities throughout America. You pay Harvard, you pay Yale, you pay even HBUs, HB, HBCUs, you know what I'm saying, uh, 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 Harvard, you know, LSU. You know, hey, look here, man. You know, this is a university of game, man. You can't beat it, man, especially coming brothers from the streets. We both been in and out of jail. You know, we've been in the streets. You know, now we in the executive suites. This man, we're going to show y'all his beautiful empire you know so hey man until next time uh be cool and make sure y'all go to the hhf awards hip-hop fraternity awards april 7. hopefully my brother tyreek will be able to come we got a lot of celebrities y'all see at the end of this video y'all see all the celebrities we got juvenile uh derez the shine we got young la we got the east little, little john east side boys gonna be coming and performing and rep repping with us man so y'all make sure y'all Come to the HHF World and go to thehiphopfraternity.com and get you one of these jackets. Of course, you know, we got Tariq, his own jacket. He's an honorary member for life. You know, it's my brother, you know, and we all about, you know, uplifting the folly men. I'm going to have another interview. I want to talk to him about the Moors and, you know, y'all know I'm Moorish American. Y'all know I'm part of the Moorish Science Temple. So I want to talk to him about the Moors. And I know a lot of my Moor brothers are going to be like, man, why you didn't ask him about the Moors? You know, he got a very interesting all take on that. But next time. So peace. Cool. Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? If you're watching this on YouTube, you're probably already at my channel. If you're not at my channel and you're watching this on social media, hey, man, all you got to do is go to Pippin' Ken, go to my YouTube, type in Pippin' Ken, my channel come up, hit subscribe, hit like, and then share. And I guarantee you, you'll be able to see all the game, all the knowledge, all the wisdom that you want to see. So all my game is at my channel, Pippin' Ken channel on YouTube. And it's free. I'm charging it to the game. Charging it to YouTube. YouTube going to pay for it, but you get it free. That's right. Go to my channel right now. Thank you. Pimp and Ken, baby. Hey, y'all. It's your girl, Sweet Shelly. And I'm your hottest host for the 2024 H.A. Chippin' Ugly Money Awards, baby. Yes. Along with the beautiful Miss Taylor, okay? And we're going to be live at the Atrium in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. So, I know you're wondering, hey, Shelly, how do I book to do live performances? Or how do I book a VIP table? Well, fear no more, my darling. All you have to do is call 404-790-9627. Voila, magic. What up, it's Ugly Money CEO, Ugly Money Nietzsche. Listen, April 5th through the 7th, the Ugly Money Music Summit slash HHF Ugly Money Awards. Now on the 7th, y'all gotta get y'all tickets because we have an award show. We're gonna be announcing the winner of the Ugly Money Music Summit and also awarding and commemorating and representing for all of the talented people, the legendary people, tons of celebrities in the building. Definitely go to the website to get your tickets today. It's that Ugly Money. This is Vato, National CEO of Hip Hop Fertility. If you want your ticket for the award show, make sure you go to Eventbrite slash HHF and get your ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on? It's the Hungry Hustling American Dream backslash African American Wet Dream. The Rock and Roll Gangster. The Kenny Red Rest in Peace of Reefer Rap. The Don Wanna Dank. The Pimpin' Ken of the Ink Pen. The Money Q Green of the Rap Scene. And just like Johnny Dollar, I make your girl holler then swallow. The Winning Loser. The Successful Failure. The Acceptable Reject. I get disrespect. I get disrespect. I get dissed. But it's with respect. OG Amsterdam, Afro, money making marijuana, smoking motherfucking MAN. You know what I'm saying? And yes, yes. 
Like my man Pippin Ken say, when all the buildings in New York City fall, Afro man will be standing tall. This ain't no joke, this ain't no gimmick. We gotta get paid after a fake police raid, monkeypox, and another pandemic. You know what I'm saying? And oh yes, oh yes, I do accept my nomination. You know what I'm saying? For the HHF Ugly Money Awards, you know what I'm saying? The Ugly Money Award. The money might be ugly, but I'm beautiful, baby. And I'm going to be looking good April 7th when I come there to get my award because I am the best player in the world. Who's a better player than Afro Man? Who be signing titties all over the world? Who be riding down the street? Getting blowjobs, posting it on there. Who? Who? Where's he at? I'm the number one player in the world. Afro money making, marijuana smoking, M A N, and I will be there April seventh at the H H F Ugly Money Awards. I accept my nomination. Afro man. Plus, I'm running for president too. 2020 fro. Let's go. Hey, it ain't no limit this year. Yeah. And it's your boy Twisted Black, man. I'm standing right here. I'm honored, man, to accept my award from HHF Ugly Money, man. This is my Lifetime Achievement Award. They say I really got it for stand down. So, man, I take that, man. I appreciate everybody behind the scenes, and I take that award. I hope I'm able to make it. Okay, this is Lil G. Phil most known over the game. I will be in Atlanta, able to accept, accept my HHF Award, Ugly Money Award. Hey man, say man, you already know what I'm finna say, man. It's the kid that did, not the kid that didn't. The reason why the sauce word was written, the master, the pastor, the him in Alaska to make the bread come faster. And I will be at the 2024 Hip Hop Fraternity Awards. I accept my nomination for album of the year. The kid that did spitting this game for a motherfucking lane. If you know what I'm saying, man. Salute the Pippi Ken, it's the dripping twin, and we're gonna be out there once again. Oi. This is Grandmaster. I will be accepting my award from the Hip Hop Attorney Awards. Look for me real soon. Keep your eyes on your prize. Hi, everyone. I would like to say that I sincerely accept my nomination for the Hip Hop Fraternity and the Ugly Money Award. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, Ivy, and everyone that's a part of this event. Thank you. Bye. I accept my nomination, man, to the Hip Hop Fraternity, man, this year. I know I missed it last year, but this year, man, I'm coming to get mine. I'm coming to get what's deserved. Y'all know with ugly money, man. With ugly money, man. Y'all know what it is. Y'all know what time we on, man. And get ready for it, baby, because we on the way. April, April 7th. What's up, man? It's the East Side Boys. It's your boy Lil Bo. It's your boy Big Sam. Y'all already know, man. We're gonna be at that war show, man, with HHL and Ugly Money. It's going down, man. Yes, sir. Be there. Yo, what up, man? It's your boy Chaotic, and I accept my nomination for the Hip Hop Eternity Award. And I should win, cuz who hotter than me? <laughs> What's going on, everybody? This is Carl Thomas, and I accept my award for the Hip Hop Eternity from my man Pimpin Ken. Absolutely. Kenneth Ivey, one of the greatest to ever do it. <laughs> Believe it. Hey, what it do is the main man, Young LA, and it's the Hip Hop Fraternity Awards, and I will be performing April 2024. I'm going to have that stuff on from the um, head to the floor, so you might want to be there and be spoiled. You already know, Young LA, I accept. This your boy, Juba the Great, and look, I accept my I accept my award because I'm winning this one for the Hip Hop Fraternity with my dog, Pimp and Ken. We go way back, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Juvie. Hey, man, I accept my award from... Yeah, hip hop fraternity, you know what I'm saying? Like, Shabba Scream Night, shout out to Pimmy King, you know what I'm talking about? All the way up, no stops, Jack, you feel me? What's going on, man? Hey, hip hop fraternity is going down, man. The Red Sun, we in the building. Yeah. Hey, 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 what's happening? It's your boy, The Red Sun, and I formally accept my nomination for the Hip Hop Fraternity Award. Get! Yeah, this your boy Bread when it came. I will be performing at the Hip Hop Fraternity Awards 2024. Salute to my bro, Pip and Ken. Yeah. All right, Texas Fresh. Fresh life, y'all. Hey, man, I accept my award for the HHF Ugly Money Award. I will be there in Atlanta, April 7th. I ain't to accept my award. Hey, Pip and Ken, keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you there, baby. Hey, this is China Doll over here in Dallas, Texas. 
Um, I'm gonna be at the awards, April 7th, HHF Ugly Money Awards. Thank you and come on out and see us. Bow, bow, Mike Fresh checking in this thing, you hear me? Shout out to the HHF Ugly Money Awards, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, your boy nominated, appreciate y'all for that nomination, man. Shout out to Villa Boy Mike K, Fred. shout out to Pimpy King for pulling Mike up Fred. on me. What's up, man? We out here, man. Hey, HHF Ugly Money Awards, man, slide down. What's up, man? This is Mississippi Gino, CEO, HHF Mississippi. HHF, we will be in Atlanta, Georgia, Sunday, February 25th for the Brunner Brother House Show. We're going to be in the barber competition. I'm bringing my shop head for We're coming down the building. We're going to be representing HHF. I'm bringing my secret weapon also. G Cuts, my son. Yes, sir. He's going to be competing in that barber competition, man. Sunday, February 25th. And we're going to be cutting Pippi Ken and having that thing, man. So HHF is going to be in the building deep, man. The Mississippi boy going to be in the building deep, man. Hey, this is Mr. Automatic, man. We will be at the HHF W Money Award. Make sure y'all get there, be square, and be on time and fly as you can be, man. What's up? You already know what it is. It's the landlord. I will be at the HHF accepting my award, man. Listen, it's going to be big landlord talk right there, man. Y'all can come. I'm going to have my VIP table. Y'all can chat it up with me. We're going to be doing whatever, man. I will be accepting my award. You better come there, man. I'll see y'all ASAP. It's your boy, Bill Boy Cash, man. I do accept my nomination for the HHF Ugly Money Awards. April 7th in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's go. Brick by brick, I built this. Hey, what up? It's your girl, China Monet, and I will be performing at the HHF and Ugly Money Music Summit Awards, April 7th. My name is Lexis, and I accept my nomination for the Ugly Money and HHF Award. My name is Tika The Truth. I want to say thank you to HHF and Ugly Money for this nomination, and I'll see you at the HHF Award. What is your dog smoke on the Almighty Mighty Field Mob? I will be pulling up April 7th at the HHF and Ugly Money. Summit, pull up, you know what I mean? I will be performing live, you know what I mean? Me and China Monet, okay. This book right here, Pippa Ken laid it on me. My God, <laughs> cross the tracks, man. Now, now let's talk about this book, and Ken is the homie. He's he a legend. He a legend. I fuck with Ken Stevo. Uh -huh. They came to me with, you know, Simon Schuster. Boss me and you the shot call. You write a book about somebody, it's about what they've been through. Hey, how you doing? This is James C.B. Gray, president and national spokesperson for the hip hop fraternity. Thank you for watching the trailer of the making of an autobiography of a celebrity featuring Little Boosie. This is your boy, Pippa Kim. I want y'all to go get my new book, The 48 Laws of the Game, Pepology, man. This is the book that everybody is reading. They love it in the prisons and selling all over the world. Everything that your father, your uncle didn't teach you, this book will. This will give you a whole lot of game. And it's for men and women. And if you want to be a winner, go get my other book, The Art of Human Chess. It's a bestseller. Both of my books are bestsellers. And if you want to get the book, just go to thehiphopfraternity.com. Go to the link, books, and hit the word, hit book. If that don't work for you, go to amazon.com. If that don't work, go to audible.com. Type in my name, Pippa Ken. I guarantee you that the book will pop up. And just order the book. We got the audio book. We got the hardcover. We got the paperback. Anything you need, just go to any one of those platforms. Barnes & Noble's Books A Million and get the book.